Good morning. I have given many speeches in my business career, but I've never had this kind of competition from former presidents, ministers, present presidents. This is a difficult one. I hope my children will recognize who I'm competing with today. It's an honor to be with you all and all of these former presidents and ministers and distinguished guests. I'm very delighted to be back in Madrid and in Spain. It's my fifth visit in the last year, and it's a great country with great people, and especially to be at this exciting global forum. We have come here for a very important reason, because none of us are or should be content with the status quo. Chronic recession and unemployment continues to hang over the developed world, not since the Great Depression of the late 1920s or 30s have we seen such economic troubles. Once again, all of us are looking for ideas that will help us answer fundamental questions. How do we take care of those in our community who can't take care of themselves? What is the strategy or strategies for getting our populations back to meaningful work? How do we get our businesses to take risks again, to grow again, to be successful again? In short, we are here at this forum because we are looking to share ideas that will again get people traveling and trading, building and buying, selling and sharing. My goal today is to stimulate a conversation and hopefully to address these vital concerns. If successful, we will have some ideas and strategies that will help all of us overcome the challenges facing our peoples, our countries, and our businesses. Some suggest that current economic woes are overstated, thanks to both political and media hyperbole. In democracies, after all, different political groups frequently focus mainly on problems while only occasionally suggesting solutions. The media can also sensationalize troubles although in fairness, they can also publicize solutions. Often those trying to be helpful have their patience tested because of so much negativity in politics and the media. But today, even if there is some political and media exaggeration, the evidence is still overwhelming. People are not only hurting, they are also asking for leadership. It's not hard to see the struggles which are all around us. Stores and business close, friends and family lose jobs, your neighbor loses a house, your son or daughter fresh out of college having to move back into a childhood bedroom because there is no work. There are also the statistics, as you know. The unemployment rate in this country was close to 25% in the fourth quarter also record youth unemployment at 55%, 55%, and you are not alone. In the United States, 28 million people do not have jobs. 50% of youth under 26 are underemployed. Experience, wrote Cervantes, is the mother of all sciences. And the experience of the 20th century, the bloodiest in our human history, taught us that demagogues and tyrants often follow on the heels of depressed economic conditions. Some of you here are old enough to have experienced the loss of freedom, the shortage of essential goods and services, and the general hopelessness of depressed friends. Trouble is again brewing with so many people on the sidelines, not participating in our society. When all of that human capital is on the sidelines, it is bad not only for those whose God-given talents are being squandered, it is also bad for the total society. Because when a human being is not a productive member, when a human being is not creating and working, it is a tragedy for every one of us. And the costs are borne by all of us, by family, by the community, by business, by government, and the world. 
In this time of global recession and joblessness, of mortgage crises and bankruptcies, our economic situation is grave. But that is not a reason for despondency. It is a reason for action. Leadership must start to fix the situation, not by just examining the underlying causes, but by also looking for a cure to our economic illness. We cannot just focus on the mountains of reasons for why it happened. The causes are, of course, complicated, involving history, economics, politics, and psychology, much of which I am surely not qualified as an expert. I don't pretend to be an economist or a political scientist or, for that matter, a futurist. I'm just a business person who has been doing business for 52 years. And yes, I grew up without television also. In many countries, many countries in business around the world. A lifetime of actual work experience provides some observations and conclusions about how we got to this present situation. Since the end of World War II, we have witnessed unprecedented growth, and not just in Europe and North America, also in countries like Brazil and Chile and India and China, Singapore and others, have grown enormously. The middle class has expanded beyond anyone's imagination. Even many people in entry-level jobs today have come to enjoy wonderful goods, services, internet, cell phones, medical treatments, computer education, modes of travel which were unheard of prior to World War II. I bring these facts up not in order to diminish the real struggles and sufferings of today, but only to point out that as the middle class has grown, so too have people's expectations and desires for more and more benefits of what the modern society has to offer. Though we have triumphed over fascism and faced down the specter of communism and other ominous threats during the last century, the toughest question of them all is this, can we survive our success? Can we continue to succeed after raising the living standards of our people for so long? One thing is certain, our success has placed even greater pressures on governments to provide more benefits for everyone in the society. Call it the success paradigm. You will respond, respond to, if you will respond to their electorates, political leaders seek to see more and more people participating and enjoying the fruits of modernity. A natural consequence of all this is that most of the developed world has built up significant debt structures, requiring significant government lending. When recessions occur in the business cycle, tax revenues go down, governments can start running out of money. And the history of economics shows that recessions will always occur in the business cycle, because there is no way to control demand in any given economy all the time, in spite of all the central banks and financial planners. This is especially problematic in countries with falling birth rights, rates like Japan. Governments must then raise taxes to continue to provide services for their people. Inevitably, even higher taxes on the few rich cannot make up the difference. And so increased taxation on the middle class is the next step, further inhibiting economic progress. Then the downward spiral accelerates. The more government needs to pay for services, the more government must take from those who produce in the society, from both businesses and individuals alike. And the more the government takes from them, the less those businesses and individuals spend on new products, new employees, new equipment, new projects. The economy shrinks and slumps. Countries in the EU and in the Western Hemisphere, particularly those with high energy demands, are now overburdened with debt, overburdened with the recession, and overburdened with unemployment. At bottom, then, our economic problem today is rooted in the discordant relationship between the private and public sectors, between the left and the right, between the policymakers and many in academia. No matter where I travel, east or west, and no matter whom I talk to, I hear the problem being described over and over again. So if that's the problem, then what's the solution? 
Is there a way to bridge the disharmony between business and government? Or are the private and, private and public sectors doomed to be forever at odds? Will there forever be battles between the left and the right? And as these battles go on, who suffers if not the people? We all know the ideological replies to such concerns. We hear the political fights every day. On one side, our angry calls for more government spending and services. On the other, our angry calls for less. Each side demonizes the other, and it often seems as though the dueling factions are the only alternatives, but they are not. About a month ago, it occurred to me that one answer to our economic woes was staring me right in the face. It dawned on me that what Las Vegas Sands is seeking to do with the governments of Spain is something that has never quite been done before, or certainly not at this magnitude. Our project represents an expanded relationship between business and government, which is not only new in scope, but can be replicated in other countries as well, bringing back growth, tax revenue, and hope. Here is a strategy that fosters jobs and income for local communities, not just during its execution, but also for years and years in the future. Our project is not like when a government tries to tackle unemployment by, say, building a new road, which only leaves people jobless again when the construction work is over. There is an old joke about those kinds of, quote, shovel-ready jobs. The Nobel laureate economist Milton Friedman was traveling in the Far East in the 60s, visiting a work site where a new canal was being built. He was shocked to see that instead of modern tractors and earth movers, the workers had shovels. He asked why there were so few machines, and the government official said, you don't understand, this is a jobs program. To which Milton replied, oh, I thought you were trying to build a canal. If it's jobs you want, you should give these workers spoons, not shovels. <laughs> I am not talking about those kinds of jobs, not those kinds of jobs at all. In cooperation with the regional government of Madrid, the national government of Spain, and the municipal government of Alcacorn, we propose a joint project that offers a new and enlarged paradigm for business and government relations, aimed at long-term job creation. The paradigm basically says, instead of governments merely taking tax dollars from business, it can work with businesses to create long-lasting job opportunities. And instead of businesses trying to avoid government overreach, businesses should recognize the value of helping government serve the community by creating tax revenue through increased and ongoing employment. This model, the model being used in our work with the governments of Spain, represents a plan of action in scale nothing like it has been done before. It is a prescription for dealing with the root tension underlying our society's troubled economic systems. And let me be clear, it is not just a model for the tourism and hospitality industry. Other businesses and governments can use it to produce tangible and long-term results in their own communities and in their own countries. The model involves four key principles. The first, private-public partnership. The bricks and mortar of our project is an example of what, can, what, of what can and will happen for Madrid and Spain as the private and public sectors partner together for the betterment of the society as a whole. In the slides on the screen, you can see a bit of our vision, uh, our vision for Madrid. Phase one will amount to $9 billion of U.S. dollars of investment, 3.6 of our money, 40% would be from our company, and 60% of debt. It includes four very large resorts of 3,000 rooms each, totaling 12,000 rooms. Future phases, phase two and phase three, could include 24,000 more rooms and 12 to 16 more resorts. There will be world-class meeting and exhibition space, over two ballrooms holding 6,000 people, and 600 meeting rooms, gaming facilities, 
which represent only 5% of the square footage of the total project, 1 million square feet of retail, dining, entertainment, nine theaters, and other amenities such as golf courses, water parks, etc. The largest facility of its kind in Europe with contiguous hotel capacity. Recreational amenities, as I mentioned, golf, tennis, water parks are included as well. Because we provide so, so many amenities, we call our resorts integrated resorts. That is, they integrate a wide array of services and goods under one roof, offering a comprehensive guest experience for tourists, for the local market, for entertainment, for conferences, for shoppers and diners, for families and friends alike. The proposed project site in Alcocorn will be transformed. Major backbone transportation and utility system improvements will be launched roads, freeways, subways, commuter rail extensions, and more. In Singapore, it took approximately 12,000 workers to build this resort that you see on the screen. 4,000 workers per shift, three shifts a day, to get this building built in the time frame of about three and a half years. Even with economies of scale, imagine the number of construction workers required to build four such resorts in Madrid, opening all on the same day, at the same time. The number could reach 40 to 50,000 con con construction workers. I'm told by the mayor of Alcacorn there are 4,000 construction workers available unemployed today. That will be only 10% of the amount needed for this project. Each one of these resorts will generate about 8,000 direct jobs, which includes LVS payroll alone, and there are many other third parties on the site. The multiplier effect of these direct jobs, including indirect and induced employment, is enormous and has been studied by outside consultants. And these jobs do not end when the project is built. These jobs continue ad infinitum. You ask the question, who will get these jobs? We will seek the primary workforce from the region of Madrid and Spain. The range of jobs and required skill levels would be very wide, and salaries and benefits would be excellent, as they are at all of our other properties. We'll offer employment opportunities to those without high school education, those with high school education, college graduates, and candidates with advanced graduate degrees. People at every level of the society will have an opportunity to find, to find rewarding careers with us, from housekeepers, to trash recyclers, to cooks, to accountants, to salespeople, to executives, general managers, and senior executives. We procure most of the services and products that we need in the local market in Spain. In Singapore, 93% of our procurement activities on an annual basis amounting to 400 million US dollars are sourced from local businesses alone. So the project will not only generate work for other businesses in the community, such as lawyers, human resource professionals, advertising agencies, architects, engineers, IT professionals, bankers, maintenance and operations service providers, goods suppliers, lines of business consultants, event planners, and many, many others. All of this new trade will therefore increase economic activity and generate significant tax revenue to provide those services, as I mentioned prior, to those individuals that cannot take care of themselves. Contrary to popular belief, our project will not take any business away from other existing businesses. In the case of Las Vegas and Macau and Singapore, our businesses will lift, have lifted and improved performances of all local businesses in the area. Millions of high spending new tourists will be driven to Madrid I can make this claim confidently because our company has a track record. Two years after Marina Bay Sands opened, tourist arrivals in Singapore increased by 46%, and tourist spending increased by an astounding 80%. Our project might even help Madrid win the bid to host the 2020 Olympics, since 12,000 additional hotel rooms are necessary, and we will have them built by 2018 and it will possibly also decrease the investment costs necessary for these hotel rooms and stadium space. These benefits for Spain 
would be impossible without the principle of private and public partnership. It could not happen without, on the one hand, a support of the government, and on the other hand, the vision and community commitment of our company's founder, Mr. Sheldon Adelson. Partnership, then, is the key to bringing about these benefits for all. Now, the second crucial principle of our business model is challenge the status quo. Cervantes wrote, to stay is no wise action when there's more reason to fear than to hope. Let me repeat, to stay is no wise action when there's more reason to fear than to hope. Think about our situation today. If we stay on the present economic course, hoping for the business cycle to save us, there is certainly more to fear than to hope. The status quo is a prescription for continued failure. Critics who want to stay, who defend the status quo, allege that our tourism project in Madrid will increase prostitution, gaming addiction, and crime. <coughs> Not true. In fact, the reverse is true. Prostitution, black market gambling, and crime proliferate when people are out of work and desperate, like they are today. Those are the social conditions that produce society's ills. By contrast, in every location where we have built, we have seen decreases in prostitution, decreases in gambling addiction, and decreases in crime. How come? Because our resorts provide legal work opportunities for poor and vulnerable people as well. Because we offer extensive gambling addiction programs to help those suffering from addiction. Because Sheldon Adelson and his wife, Dr. Marion Madison Adelson, are passionate about setting up free drug and, drug and abuse clinics in every location. Because the crimes once associated with black market gambling have now been brought under the power of the state. Our critics seem to derive their conception of Las Vegas from the inaccuracies and sensationalism of Hollywood movies, along with everything else in Hollywood movies. They don't know that our resorts are highly regulated institutions which have far more to lose than to gain from breaking the law. Shareholders and executives with MBAs, not Hollywood mobsters, now run resorts of Las Vegas. The universal social ills afflicting our communities, these we all worry about. But as leaders, we need to address social ills based on facts, not on what we see in the movies. And we need to base our policies on what will benefit society, and nothing benefits society more than having people working. To get people back to work will require the continually challenging the status quo. The third principle of our model, businesses should honor values more than profit. Honor values more than profit seems like an odd thing for a business person to say. But the maxim is true. In the wake of Enron and other corporate scandals, it is even truer today. People's trust in business has, in recent years, diminished profoundly. Dishonesty and greed don't lead to long-term profits. Rather, those vices only undermine consumer faith, hurting all of us. Honor values over profit, because trade cannot thrive when the people involved cannot trust each other. All successful businesses, all of them, if they hope to survive over the long run, must ultimately rest on a foundation of agreed rules and ethical feelings, honesty, empathy, and respect for human dignity at every level of the organization. My industry, the tourism and hotel industry, is a people-centered business par excellence. The industry is, after all, called hospitality, which means we're expected to be hospitable, to be considerate, to be welcoming. These values are what our resorts will offer the tourists coming to Madrid. But all businesses ought to strive to embody those virtues because values are at the heart of profit and good business practice. Profit comes as word spreads that you and your organization are predictable and trustworthy. Finally, the last principle behind our project in Spain is about how leaders should manage people. Very simple. The principle can be summarized. Manage others as you would be managed. 
Native Americans have a saying, don't criticize a man until you've walked a mile in his moccasins. If in business, we might say, think about how you would like someone to manage you if the roles were reversed. Companies prosper when their team members treat each other as fellow beings with common human emotions and anxieties, when they know their superiors won't embarrass them or claim their, accompli <clears throat> claim their accomplishments, when they are motivated to share goals together. To create this sort of business culture comes down to appreciating the words of the great Spanish philosopher Miguel de Unamuno, who wrote The Tragic Sense of Life, quote, I am a man, no other man do I deem a stranger. Unamuno was trying to get us to remember that people with whom we work and live are not just abstract categories, employees, managers, customers, or voters. No, they are what Unamuno called men of flesh and bone, real people like us, trying to find the security in a tragic world. This is the same lesson that was taught to me in my childhood. I grew up with my immigrant parents in a small apartment building in Boston. Sheldon Adelson, our founder, grew up about two miles from me. I like to say he was in a poorer section. My father was a traveling salesman. One grandfather sold fish, the other blue jeans. Our lives weren't rich or easy, but I learned a great deal from those immigrant parents, how fragile life could be, how important work was to a person's sense of self, how people ought to have the right to enjoy the fruits of their labor. Those were good people. They didn't judge on the basis of hearsay. They weren't blinded by rank. They weren't ostentatious with achievements. Later in life, when I took on leadership roles, I realized that the lives of those immigrants and the values they lived by held important lessons for business. Manage others as you would be managed is the distillation of those lessons. It is the man management philosophy that we at Sands work to see in our leadership and which you will also find at our resorts in Madrid. It is a philosophy central to a well-run business, whatever the industry, and a well-run society. And it is part of the prescription for today's general business woes, for it is about how we treat others in the workplace. In conclusion, these four principles seek private public partnerships, challenge the status quo, honor values over profit, manage others as you would have managed you. These four principles are behind our project in Spain, and they are a plan of action to help revive our failing economies everywhere. The unemployment rates today are hindering the cause of freedom, and they will lead to ever more social ills in our communities because an idle, an idle mind is the devil's playground. If we stay with the status quo, there is more to fear than to hope, make no mistake. It is a time to be daring. And as I said to President Gonzalez when we presented our tourism plan for Madrid, regardless of what party you're in, should our product occur and be successful, you've made a decision to support a legacy project that will live for many years offering people ongoing employment. Our partnership is not a political decision. It is a people decision. It is a human decision. And it is a new paradigm for the private and public sectors. It is a model of cooperation, not competition. A model of dialogue, not monologue. A model of change, of trust, and of hope. There is an old fable about a scorpion and a frog meeting on the bank of a stream. The scorpion asked the frog to carry him across the track, on his back. The frog asked, how do I know you won't sting me? The scorpion says, because if I do, I will die too. The frog is satisfied, and they set out. But in the midstream, the scorpion stings the frog. The frog feels the onset of paralysis and starts to sink. Knowing they both will now die, he gasps. Why? Replies the scorpion, it is my nature. Far too often, leaders from the worlds of business and government have been like the frog and the scorpion, trapped in their own deadly dance, 
unable to overcome natural tendencies to distrust each other's motivation, to distrust each other's intentions, and natural tendencies. Our work together here in Spain just might break that mutual distrust and reveal a new and better path for forward, better path forward for government and business leaders and forge a new way of doing business together, one based on mutual trust and cooperation for the common good. Ultimately, isn't that what leadership is actually about? I know that it is the spirit of cooperation, and I use the term deliberately, the word spirit, that will save us from the gridlock that grinds down many modern economies, that grinds down the hope of its people. And it will involve faith, because it is our faith in each other that will break that gridlock. And that spirit and faith will be on display for other leaders to see and to emulate. Faith and spirit, those aren't two words that business leaders typically throw around at meetings like this. But isn't that what every new venture is ultimately predicated on, faith and spirit? Our work together in the coming years will, I hope, inspire those great human attributes in others and inspire the people we are blessed to serve and to lead, to believe that all of us working together can solve our toughest problems. And reverse what the famous economist and philosopher Friedrich Hayek called the road to serfdom, leading us back to the path of prosperity and freedom for all people. Thank you very much.